both alike in dignity, <laughs> in fairest Berkeley where we lay our scene, have come to plead in law and equity. Did Friar Lawrence kill these two young teens? Thank you for joining us for this trial of Friar Lawrence. We're delighted that you're here tonight, or today, I should say. My name is Eli Simon. I'm the artistic director of New Swan Shakespeare Festival at UC Irvine. And I wanted to remind you that you are all members of our jury, whether you're here live or you're watching online. We will give you instructions on how to vote later after the trial. <laughs> We're going to start by presenting a few key scenes from Shakespeare's Ro Romeo and Juliet uh, before moving into the trial itself. So um, here's a bit of background on the play. The friar is a close friend and confidant of Romeo's. He supports the young lovers and helps them to marry in secret. After Romeo is banished, he makes a potion and instructs Juliet to take it so that she will appear to be dead. Juliet ingests the potion and is buried in the family tomb. Friar Lawrence sends Romeo a letter about the plan, but due to an outbreak of the plague, <laughs> the message does not reach him. Believing that Juliet has died, Romeo goes to the family crypt, sees her motionless form, and kills himself. Juliet awakens, finds Romeo dead, and kills herself. To get things rolling today, I'd like to introduce to you Andrew Borba, who's an actor and director and professor at UC Irvine. He will be presenting The Friar. This is from Act Two, Scene Three. Andrew Borba. Gray-eyed morn smiles upon the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light. And freckled darkness like a drunkard reels from fourth day's path and tightens fiery wheels. Now, ere the sun advances burning, I, the day to cheer and night's dank dew to dry, I must I'll fill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious, juiced flowers. <sighs> Mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For not so vile, but from this earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give nor not so good, but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice when misapplied, and vice sometimes by actions dignified. Within the rind of this small flower, poison hath residence, and medicine power. For this being smelt for that part, Cheers each part. Being tasted slays all senses with the heart. Two such opposed kings encamp them still in man as well as herbs. Grace and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Okay, this next scene features Crystal Kim, who's playing Juliet, and the friar, and this is from Act Four, Scene One. Oh, shut the door, and when thou hast done so, come weep with me, past hope, past cure, past help. Oh, Juliet, I already know thy grief. It strains me past the compass of my wits. I hear thou must, and nothing may prorogue it, but Thursday next be married to this county? Tell me not, friar, that thou hearst of this, unless thou tell me how I may prevent it. If in thy wisdom thou canst give no help, do thou but call my resolution wise, and with this knife I'll help it presently. Be not so long to speak. 
I long to die if what thou speak speak not a remedy. Halt, daughter. I do spy a kind of remedy which craves as desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. If, rather than to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength of will to slay thyself, is it then likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chide away this shame, that copes with death himself to escape from it? If thou darest, I'll give thee remedy. Oh, bid me leap rather than marry Paris. Or bid me go into a new-made grave and hide me with a dead man in a shroud. Things that to hear them told have made me tremble. And I will do it without fear or doubt to live an unstained wife to my sweet love. Hold it. Go home. Be merry. Give consent to marry Paris. Wednesday is tomorrow. Tomorrow night, look that thou lie alone. Let not thy nurse lie with thee in thy chamber. Take thou this vial, being then in bed, and this distilled liquor drink thou off. When presently through all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humor, no pulse shall keep his native progress, but surcief, no warmth, no breath shall testify thou lifts the rosy color of thy lips and cheeks shall fade to paley ashes. Thy eyes window shut like death when he shuts up the day of life. Each part deprived of supple government shall stiff and stark and cold appear like death. And in that borrowed likeness of shrunk death shalt thou continue two and forty hours and then awake as from a pleasant sleep. Now, when the bridegroom in the morning comes to rouse thee from thy bed, there art thou dead. Then, as the manner of our country is, in thy best robes open on the bier, shalt thou be born to that same ancient vault where all the kindred of the Capulets lie. In the meantime, against thou shalt awake, shall I, uh, wrote shall Romeo, by my letters, know our drift. And hither shall he come, and he and I will watch Thy waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee hence to Mantua. And this shall free thee from this present shame. If no inconstant fear nor womanish toy abate thee from thy acting it. Give me, give me. Yeah. Oh, tell me not a fear. Hold. Get thee gone. Be strong and prosperous in this resolve. Love, give me strength, and strength shall help afford. Farewell, dear father. And next we have a monologue from Act Four, Scene Three. This features again Crystal Kim as Juliet. My dismal scene. I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No. No. This shall forbid it. Lie thou there. What if it be a poison? which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonored because he married me before to Romeo? There's a fearful point. And yet, methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. How if, when I am laid into the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There's a fearful point. Shall I not then be stifled in the vault? to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in, and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Oh, if I wake, 
Shall I not be distraught? Environed with all these hideous fears and madly play with my forefather's joints and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud and in this rage with some great kinsman's bones as with the club dash out my desperate brains? <gasps> Look! Methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that despite his body upon a rapier's point, stay, Tybalt, stay! Romeo, 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 here's drink. I drink to thee. Now, please welcome Kieran Berry, who is playing Romeo. This monologue is from Act 5, Scene 3. Dear Juliet, why art thou yet so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous? And that the lean, abhorred monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour? For fear of that, I still will stay with thee, and never from this palace of dim night depart again. Here, here will I remain with worms that are thy chambermaids. Here will I set up my everlasting rest and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. Eyes, look your last. Arms, take your last embrace. And lips, oh, you the doors of breath. Seal with a righteous kiss, a dateless bargain to engrossing death. Come, bitter conduct. Come, unsavory guide, thou desperate pilot. Thou at once run on the dashing rocks thy seasick, weary bark. Here's to my love. True apothecary, thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. leave them here for the time. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, please welcome, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, now join me in welcoming our distinguished lawyers, Erwin Chemerinsky, Jesse H. Choper, distinguished professor of law, and dean of Berkeley Law will be arguing for the prosecution. And Bernadette Myler, Carl and Sheila Spaeth, Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research and Intellectual Life at Stanford Law School, will be arguing for the defense. Hey, 
please also welcome the Honorable Andrew Guilford, 14-year veteran of the U.S. District Court in California. Judge Guilford will read the charges and preside over the trial. And after the trial, you will receive instructions on how to vote. Because remember, you are members of the jury. Here is our judge, the Honorable. The Honorable Judge will now take over the trial. This district court of the city of Berkeley is now in session. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we celebrate the joy of coming together, coming together in this audience to experience the theater. A few of you said this is the first time you've been back in the theater, and for that I thank you, and we welcome you all. We also celebrate three great California universities sending us their leaders and professionals to put on this show for you, and we thank them as well. And finally, we thank the actors and attorneys coming together this afternoon as art and the law comes together in the presentation we are about to make. Ladies and gentlemen, as you heard, you are the jury. It's an important responsibility. We have before you now two attorneys who will argue the case for the prosecution against Friar Lawrence and for the defense of Friar Lawrence. Uh, during their presentations, they will refer to the law that is applicable. It is the law of today, 2022, in this fair city of Berkeley. The charges against Friar Lawrence are two. One, he's been charged with involuntary manslaughter. And two, he's been charged with child endangerment. <laughs> we will begin with the prosecution, who will argue for 15 minutes or so on behalf of the prosecution. Dean Shimerinsky. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Judge Guilford, it's an honor and a pleasure to appear before you. It is wonderful to be together in person again. It's wonderful to be with my esteemed opposing counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here today because two children a 13-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy died tragically and unnecessarily. We are here today because the law requires that we hold responsible an individual who endangered these children and contributed to their death. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here because it is important that you send a message that we are each responsible for our words and our deeds. This is a message as important, if not more important today, than even centuries ago. In other trials, I might say to you that your responsibility is to unravel a mystery and figure out who is responsible. But in this case, there is no mystery. There is no doubt. Friar Lawrence, through his recklessness, endangered these children and contributed to their death. I just said what I think is the key word for this trial, recklessness. If you are convinced, as I'm sure you will be, that his recklessness endangered these children, if you are convinced that his recklessness contributed to the death of these children, then the only possible verdict is guilty. Now, there are other crimes where it's necessary to prove intent. If this is about first-degree murder, we need to show that he intended their death. But this case isn't about intent. This case is about, was he reckless in a way that endangered them? Was he reckless in a way that contributed to their death? As Judge Guilford just told you, there are two charges. The first is child endangerment. We should always begin with the law 
And today you are applying the law of California. Specifically here, it is California Penal Code Section 273A that makes child endangerment a crime. And the crucial language says that a person is guilty if he or she willfully causes or permits that child to be placed in a situation where her person or health is endangered. I would suggest to you that everything that Friar Lawrence did in Romeo and Juliet is the very essence of child endangerment. <laughs> but let me point to two specific instances of child endangerment. Obviously, either would justify a guilty verdict. The first is giving to Juliet a powerful narcotic to put her in a deep coma. In fact, you heard the scene where the friar spoke those words to you. Well, let me remind you of them, because it is the evidence in this case. The friar says to Juliet, take thou this vial, being then in bed, and this distilled liquor, liquor drink thou up, when presently through all thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humor for no pulse. He goes on, no warmth, no breath shall testify thou livest, the roses in thy lips and cheeks shall fade to pale ashes. Thy windows, eyes windows fall. Like death, when he shuts up the day of life, each part deprived of supple government. Was he a doctor giving this as an anesthesia to Juliet before a medical proceeding? No. Was he trained as a doctor to be sure that what was given would not kill her? He gave her a powerful narcotic that put her in a deep coma. That, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, by itself is child endangerment. Imagine that somebody today, here in Berkeley, or there in Palo Alto, would give to a 13-year-old a narcotic <laughs> drug, or as described here, even a liquor that would put them in a deep coma. Wouldn't you on that basis say, that was child endangerment, and I just ask you to apply that same common sense here. But there's another incident of child endangerment that I would point to. It happens more at the end of the story. It's when Juliet awakens and discovers that Romeo is dead. Now, earlier, Juliet had told the friar that she would take her own life if she couldn't be through Romeo. So the friar is with Juliet at this moment. And what does he do? Does he take this 13-year-old girl to her parents so they can care for her? Does he take her to those who make sure she does not harm herself? Does he stay with her to make sure she doesn't hurt herself? She sees Romeo's dagger there. Does he take away the knife so she won't hurt herself? No, what he does is flee. Again, look at the record that you have, and the evidence is clear. <laughs> In Act 5, the friar says, I hear some noise. Lady, come from that nest of death, contagion, and unnatural sleep. Then, noise again. And the friar says, I dare no longer stay. And he runs away. <laughs> Juliet, at that moment then, decides she's going to kill herself. She kisses Romeo, thinking the poison on his lips will take away her life. When it doesn't, she then takes his dagger and stabs herself and dies. Again, imagine this happened not in Shakespearean times, but today in Berkeley or in Palo Alto. Imagine an adult is with a 13-year-old girl. The 13-year-old girl has threatened suicide, is extremely distraught, and has a knife to kill herself. And imagine that instead of doing anything to help her, that adult flees and runs away. That's the very essence of child endangerment. And that's why in the first count, the only possible verdict is guilty. But there is a second count here, involuntary manslaughter. And once more, I think it's important to start with the law. Here, we're talking about California Penal Code Section 192, and specifically sub B focused on involuntary manslaughter. And it says, 
in the commission of an unlawful act, not a monument or a felony, or in the commission of a lawful act, which might produce death in an unlawful manner, without due caution and circumspection, causes the death of a person. So what does it mean in plain English? If somebody's reckless acts create a high risk of death or serious bodily injury, and if the reasonable person would not act in that way, that's involuntary manslaughter. There doesn't have to be any intent to kill. It's that the recklessness causes a person's life to be lost. And here, again, I would suggest to you, there's no doubt that the friar was reckless. Think about what he did step by step. He marries a 13-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy <laughs> without consent of their parents. By the way, that violates California law. You have to be 18. <laughs> Romeo has been banished for killing someone else, and the friar hides him. That's a felony in California, harboring a felon. <laughs> but then he comes up with this idea that he's going to give Juliet this narcotic drug that puts her in a deep coma, send Romeo away, then Romeo can come back after everyone thinks Juliet is dead, and that they can then run away together. There is a technical term for such an idea in the law. A really dumbass idea. <laughs> and of course, giving Juliet the narcotic drug is itself a felony. In fact, it's several different felonies. <laughs> but the recklessness doesn't stop there. How is he going to inform Romeo of what he's doing? He sends a letter. <laughs> if you wanted to get life or death information to somebody, <laughs> truly this is about life or death, would you send a letter? <laughs> the letter doesn't arrive in time. Romeo comes, thinks Juliet is dead, so he kills himself. But the friar's recklessness doesn't stop there. As I told you, he's with Juliet when she awakens. He sees how distraught she is. He sees there's a dagger that she kills her with. And what does he do? He runs away. He flees. Leaves her to kill herself. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you put all that together, isn't the very essence of that recklessness that contributed to the loss of life of others? That, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is the very definition of involuntary manslaughter. But if I've not convinced you yet, I have the most powerful possible evidence of his guilt for this crime. His own confession. Listen to his words as you, again, look at the record. Here, focusing on Act 5, the friar says, I am the greatest able to do the least, yet most suspected is the time and place. Doth make against me of this direful murder, and here I stand both to impeach and purge, myself condemned and myself excused. He says, miscarried by my fault, let my old life be sacrificed some hour before his time under the rigor of severest law. That is a confession that he was responsible for these deaths, which is why you need to find him guilty. Now it's quite possible, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that had the friar not intervened, Romeo and Juliet would have, like many young lovers, gone their separate ways and married others. It's also possible that they would have later in life found one another and had a lifelong romance. So the story of Romeo and Juliet would be for us the story of enduring love. But instead, the story of Romeo and Juliet has always been known as a tragedy. And it is because two children died and this man, the friar, is responsible. So the only possible verdict in this case, on both counts, is guilty. Thank you, Dean. At the conclusion, you'll have five minutes for rebuttal as well. Professor, for the defense.
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Judge Guildford, this case is about a terrible tragedy, as you've heard, the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. In the wake of any tragedy, it is a very human response to seek a villain on whom to lay the blame. But I feel that if Shakespeare himself were among us today, he would, with a woeful heart, dub these lovers star-crossed. <laughs> and what does star-crossed mean? It means they are subject to disaster. Disaster from the Latin via Italy, meaning ill-starred. We even heard Romeo uh, talk of his inauspicious stars at the beginning. While my distinguished colleague may reply that the fault lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. None of us has to follow the daily astrology column to understand that in the course of human events, tragedies occur which are more the matter of fate than of human agency. As I said, when a tragedy of this magnitude happens to two wonderful young people ripped in untimely fashion from their community, our natural impulse is to find someone to blame. <laughs> if we were to go down that route to find someone to blame, there would be many people who would fit the bill. Tybalt, whose readiness to draw his weapon and assault Mercutio set in process this whole tragic chain of action. The prince, who failed to keep order in his city. The apothecary, who illegally sold Romeo poison. Friar John, who neglected to convey Friar Lawrence's letter to Romeo and didn't tell him that in a timely fashion. <coughs> and even, if I'm being honest, Romeo himself, who should have left Mercutio's punishment to the state rather than taking it upon himself. And there are two other people who are not on trial today, Montague and Capula, the fathers of these two children. Their two households may be alike in dignity, but they're also alike in some very bad behavior. <laughs> Their ancient grudges and new feuds, I would offer, may well have been the ultimate cause of the death of these two lovers. Capula even threatened to throw Juliet out of his house if she refused to marry Count Paris. How convenient it would be for old Montague and old Capulet to have the guilt of their long-standing crimes hung on the head of some poor old friar who could suffer in their stead. <laughs> convenient, but false. The false justice of the scapegoat rather than the redemption and transfiguration of genuine tragedy. I don't see any of these people on trial here today. No, the state has chosen to scapegoat Friar Lawrence and single him out as responsible for this awful tragedy. The person my distinguished opponent described is unrecognizable to me. So I will remind you, this is Friar Lawrence whose guilt we're considering today. Friar Lawrence, the peacemaker, who was fervently trying to stop the internecine conflict between Montagues and Capulets. Friar Lawrence, the consoler, to whom Romeo and Juliet both turned for sage advice on many occasions. Friar Lawrence, the man who took up a crowbar himself to release Juliet from the tomb when he discovered that Romeo didn't know what happened. And Friar Lawrence, who offered to die in a passage much misconstrued by opposing counsel, <laughs> uh, if he were at fault for what occurred, saying, if aught in this miscarried by my fault, let my old life be sacrificed some hour before his time unto the rigor of severest law. For this case, he has even declined to plead benefit of clergy, which would have exempted him from punishment for this first offense. <laughs> Despite Friar Lawrence's honorable offer, the state must prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty of a crime before it can punish him. The prosecution has not even come close to doing so. While Friar Lawrence may have miscalculated the effects of some of his actions, he had few available alternatives. He had on his hands two teenagers who had threatened suicide 
multiple times and had weapons readily available to follow through on those threats. Ordinarily, the best course would be to contact their parents and encourage them to seek mental health services for their children. <laughs> However, he was faced with highly unreasonable and feuding parents whom the friar might well assume might, would not listen to him. Friar Lawrence, my client, did his best in navigating these difficult shoals. We've heard from my distinguished colleague prosecuting this case that he believes he could prove Friar, Friar Lawrence guilty of both involuntary manslaughter and child endangerment. Under California law, a defendant can be convicted of involuntary manslaughter based on a lawful act that resulted in a killing if and only if the defendant acted with criminal negligence and the defendant's act was a substantial factor in causing the victim's death. We can see here that a killing in the form of these uh, unfortunate deaths did take place. But crucially, the prosecution has not proved beyond a reasonable doubt either that Friar Lawrence acted with criminal negligence or, as he said, recklessness, or that his act was a substantial factor in causing these deaths. So what is criminal negligence or recklessness? California law makes clear that criminal negligence involves more than ordinary carelessness, inattention, or a mistake in judgment. If a person acts with criminal negligence, they act uh, in a reckless way that creates a high risk of death or great bodily injury. And a reasonable person would not have known that acting in that way would create such a risk. In other words, a person acts with criminal negligence when the way he or she acts is so different from the way an ordinary careful person would act that his or her act amounts to disregard for human life or indifference to the consequences of that act. It's more than ordinary negligence that you would have in a civil lawsuit between people. So what is conduct that would count as criminal negligent, criminally negligent? Some examples from past cases include relying on prayer alone and denying medical treatment to a child afflicted with a deadly bacterial infection. It includes taunting someone who refused to play Russian roulette until he took the gun and shot himself as part of the game. It includes applying a poison to someone's face and neck for cosmetic purposes, <laughs> resulting in their death. Do these examples sound remotely like what Friar Lawrence did? Absolutely not. <laughs> Friar Lawrence could have turned the desperate and suicidal Juliet away and told her to depend on her prayers for relief rather than human solutions. We can be pretty sure that the result in that case would have been no better. Friar Lawrence did give Juliet a sleeping potion, but it was not poison as in an adolescent flight of fancy she speculated it might be, and instead it did exactly what he had promised, putting her into a sleep that appeared like death for only 42 hours, after which she awoke as good as new. I will read, in fact, the rest of the passage that uh, my opposing counsel so conveniently omitted uh, that begins right after he concluded. Uh, so Friar Lawrence says, and in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death, Thou shalt continue two and forty hours, and then awake as from a pleasant sleep. So uh, he never was at risk of poisoning her or uh, any other adverse consequences from this drug, nor do we know that this drug, as my opposing counsel speculated, was on any list of regulated narcotics <laughs> or prevented under either California law or federal law. <clears throat> Furthermore, he knew exactly when she would awake um, and even uh, said that uh, the exact time when she would awake. Some might argue that the good friar should have gone to Juliet's parents and explained the whole situation. That he had married her to Romeo in order to help end the fearful feud between the families and that therefore she wasn't available for another marriage to Count Paris. <laughs> but this approach would have required Friar Lawrence to violate the secrecy of the confessional. And as even Count Paris notes, Juliet treats Friar Lawrence as her confessor. Telling all to Juliet's family would have undone Friar Lawrence's duty of confidentiality, 
one that our law well recognizes through the priest penitent privilege and evidence. Nor was Friar Lawrence criminally negligent for allowing Juliet to be placed within the family tomb. There was no danger to be feared from this tomb itself. It's easily opened, as Romeo's quick and successful efforts to do so demonstrate. Furthermore, Friar Lawrence didn't rely entirely on Romeo's arrival to ensure that Juliet would be able to get out of the monument. He kept careful track of the time and hastened over himself to the tomb with a crowbar once he discovered that Friar John had not brought his message to Romeo. As Friar Lawrence noted, now must I to the monument alone. Within three hours will fair Juliet wake. She will beshrew me much that Romeo hath had no notice of these accidents, but I will write again to Mantua and keep her at my cell till Romeo come. So he was going to keep her in his own custody to keep her safe until Romeo arrived. Furthermore, Friar Lawrence took due care that Romeo know his scheme and not mistakenly hear that Juliet had died. He carefully instructed Friar John to bring a letter with all of the relevant information to Romeo in Mantua. Friar John was instead locked up in a house, feared to be plague-ridden, and didn't even get a message out to Friar Lawrence to tell him the that was the case. So Friar Lawrence, when he learned about this, spoke about, aloud about his fear that Friar John's neglecting it, i.e. the letter, may do much danger. Now, my opposing counsel has made much of the idea that Friar Lawrence fled the scene of uh, the tomb when uh, he discovered that there was a noise uh, coming, uh, of people coming. Now, I just want to read to you his own explanation of this uh, passage uh, and of this scene when he is speaking to the general public. He explains that a noise did scare me from the tomb and she, too desperate, would not go with me, but as it seems, did violence on herself. Now, the scene demonstrates that Friar Lawrence was very clear about urging Juliet to follow him and urging her out of the tomb. And one can only assume that he thought she might not come with him as a result of that urging, um, which she did not do. Furthermore, he didn't know that there was necessarily a weapon she would use in the tomb itself. Uh, there had been blood all around, um, and he might have assumed that Romeo had died not by poison, but rather uh, through being stabbed by, uh, by Count Paris. So uh, he didn't necessarily know that there would be poison for her to uh, die from as well. Two minutes, counsel. Um, the uh, state, uh, all of this demonstrates that Friar Lawrence acted with due care under very challenging and exigent circumstances. He was far from negligent in attending to the least detail, and the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he acted so differently from the way an ordinarily careful person would act in the same situation that it amounted to disregard for human life or indifference to the consequences of that act. The state can't prove the second element of the offense either, that Friar Lawrence's conduct was a substantial factor in the deaths of Romeo and Juliet. Both Romeo and Juliet came to him in a desperate state. He offered them a way out of an impossible situation, but he could not ameliorate Romeo's rashness despite his long-standing best efforts. If anything, it was that rashness that resulted and was the proximate cause of tragedy, not Friar Lawrence's actions. The friar had long been counseling Romeo on his futile love for Rosalind when suddenly Romeo's affections changed to Juliet. Friar Lawrence, as a good mentor would, chided Romeo for allowing his passions to roam unchecked. But Romeo never listened. Even after his marriage to Juliet, Romeo's very next deed was to slay Tybalt. And as soon as he heard about Juliet's death, rather than trying to confirm the rumor and figure out what had actually happened, he purchased poison and headed to the Capulet tomb. Once there, he killed Paris as well. By that point, he had condemned himself to death, having returned from exile without authorization and also murdered another upstanding citizen. Regardless of whether Juliet was asleep or dead, Romeo's fate was sealed by his own rashness, not by Friar Lawrence's actions. And while Friar Lawrence attempted to comfort Juliet, he could not overcome her grief at Romeo's demise. Friar Lawrence's conduct was therefore not a substantial factor in, her, in either death. 
The state has also charged my client with child endangerment. Under California law, as you've heard, child endangerment takes place when any person under circumstances or conditions likely to produce great bodily harm or death willfully causes or permits that child to be placed in a situation where his or her person or health is endangered. The California Supreme Court has also repeatedly interpreted this section as requiring a mental state of criminal negligence on the part of the accused. For the same reasons as Friar Lawrence is innocent of, uh, of uh, manslaughter and of uh, involuntary manslaughter, the state has failed to demonstrate criminal negligence and has also failed to show that he willfully caused or permitted uh, any children to be placed in a situation where their health or person were endangered. Sometimes the fault does lie in the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Romeo and Juliet suffered a terrible tragedy, and for that we must mourn. But to add a separate and unnecessary tragedy on top of the original one would be merely to pile woe upon woe. Our lovers cannot be brought back to life by blaming an innocent cleric who did his very best to resolve their problems and even to settle the feud between their families. Friar Lawrence could not have foreseen the chain of events that led from his plan to their deaths, and he was not a substantial cause of those deaths. It might be convenient for us, and even more so for the Capulets and Montagues, to make a scapegoat of this kind man. But in truth, the whole community was responsible for failing to hear and protect these young people. All are punished, says the prince. It is only by assuming this collective responsibility that this tragedy can be properly resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And now, in rebuttal, we'll hear from the dean. In listening to opposing counsel, I realized the relationship between Romeo and Juliet and COVID. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet is about a crisis in Rona, and COVID is about a coronavirus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there are two charges here. The first is child endangerment. We don't disagree as to the law. But here I point to two specific instances of child endangerment. One is when the friar gave to Juliet a powerful narcotic. It put her in a coma. What does opposing counsel say? She says, it wasn't a poison, and it's not on the list of prohibited substances. <laughs> if you look at Friar's own language, he said he was giving her a liquor. Giving a liquor to a 13-year-old is child endangerment. <laughs> But I also ask you to use your common sense. What substances put somebody in a deep coma for two days? It is a narcotic. And giving a 13-year-old a narcotic is child endangerment. The second example of child endangerment was leaving Juliet when she was distraught, suicidal, with a weapon there. So what does opposing counsel say? He urged her to follow. And she reads the words to you, but they're not what she says they mean. He says here, but then a noise did scare me from the tomb, and she too desperate would not go with me. So what does he do? Does he stay with her? Does he take away the weapon? He runs away, leaving a suicidal girl with a weapon there. Well, opposing counsel says he didn't know there was a weapon. Just a few sentences later, she sees the dagger and stabs herself. If she could see the dagger, so surely could Friar Lawrence. <laughs> child endangerment, it's clear the friar is guilty. The second charge is involuntary manslaughter. If your opposing counsel says this requires criminal negligence, and she's absolutely right, let me read you the law with regard to criminal negligence. It says, the defendant acted so recklessly that he or she created risk of death or injury. The act demonstrated a disregard when indifference to human life. In a reasonable person in a similar situation, would have known that the act could result in harm. All of these elements of criminal negligence are met here. Giving Juliet the 
potion that put her in a deep coma, put her life in danger. That she didn't die doesn't in any way undermine its child endangerment, nor does it deny that it contributed to what ultimately caused her and Romeo's death. Also, that he didn't make sure that Romeo knew what was happening. A letter is not a sufficient way of giving notice when life and death are at stake. But worst of all, as I said to you, he left Juliet, who was distraught and suicidal, with the dagger that she killed herself with. This is criminal negligence. Now the only question is, if you put all of this together, did it cause the death of Juliet? Can it be said that it contributed to the death of Romeo? Of course it can. That's why there's guilt. And finally, I said, if you have any doubt, there's the confession. And she says, oh, it wasn't a confession. It was a hypothetical. That's not his words. His words admit that he is responsible for this direful murder. Now, opposing counsel says a few other things. He says, look at all of the other people who are responsible. Criminal defense lawyers always try this defense. It's called, <laughs> some other guy did it. <laughs> but she can't point to some other guy here. There may be many people who are responsible, but that doesn't excuse the friar's criminal activity. It doesn't deny that he engaged in child endangerment. It doesn't deny that he's responsible for these deaths through his recklessness, involuntary manslaughter. She says that the friar was a peacemaker, a consoler. Well, first, his motives don't matter here. If you find that his activities were child endangerment, if you find that he was reckless and that contributed to the deaths, then you must find him guilty, whatever his underlying motive. But I actually believe his motives were not so pure. I think that he was trying to marry Romeo and Juliet, not out of compassion or caring for them. No one would marry a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old and known each other for one day out of compassion. <laughs> he was trying to be the peacemaker. He was trying to bring the families together. And at the very end, when he flees and abandons Juliet, he's not acting in her best interest. He's trying to save his own hide. That's not motives that we should admire. Opposing counsel says that he had few alternatives. I think he had many alternatives. Don't marry a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old who've known each other for one day. <laughs> Don't harbor a felon. Don't hatch this nonsense plan where you're going to put her in a deep coma, send him away, have him come back, and then have them run off together. And that, of course, is what ultimately leads to these death, the deaths of these two children. Opposing counsel says that the fire has a duty of confidentiality. Actually, the law is different when you're dealing with a child. When you're dealing with a child whose life is in danger, here, he would be a mandatory reporter would have the obligation to take action to save her life. And that's what he didn't do. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what we can't ignore here is that two children, a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old, died. And we can't ignore that the friar, through his conduct, endangered their lives and contributed to the deaths. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the only possible verdict in this case is guilty on both counts. Thank you, Dean. To you, Professor. I'll reread the passage that uh, Friar Lawrence speaks. He says, and if aught in this has miscarried by my fault, let my old life be sacrificed some hour before his time, if aught. As law professors, we know what hypotheticals are. Uh, my opposing counsel should be well aware what a hypothetical uh, implies. It doesn't imply an actual fact. It's not a confession. It's an if, an if statement. So he's saying, if this be true, then let my life be forfeit. Um, now, it, it turns out that child endangerment statutes and involuntary manslaughter carry much more minimal penalties than life. But I, I just want to emphasize this because Friar Lawrence is willing to sacrifice his own life if he was responsible. But I would argue to you that he was not responsible. Um, as my opposing counsel says, we can't ignore uh, what happened. We can't ignore these deaths. But law, I would say, is not always the solution. 
a criminal trial, a criminal conviction is not always the solution for social harms, and that's what is the case in this instance. Uh, just a few small points. Um, there's no relation between the potion that Friar Lawrence gives to Juliet and her death, um, so there is no causal link there. Um, nor uh, is there really uh, any evidence of the dangerousness of the potion. It makes her fall asleep, but uh, we have no evidence of any other harm that could be caused by that potion. Um, and uh, there's also no minimum age of marriage under California law. Uh, so there's, uh, there isn't uh, a reason why Friar Lawrence should be uh, held particularly culpable for uh, encouraging the marriage of these two young lovers. I just want to say that uh, this is a tragedy, but it's not a tragedy that we should increase by condemning Friar Lawrence. Thank you very much. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now for you, the jury, to decide the fate of Friar Lawrence. Here's what we'll do. Take your cell phone, take your program, and look at the QR box here, and hold your camera up to it. While we're tabulating, we have one more scene for you, uh, for your entertainment. <laughs> All right, here's a scene from uh, Romeo and Juliet before they die. Uh, in the bedroom, act four. We'll bring our actors back out, we'll tabulate, and then we'll have results for you. Wilt thou be gone? It is not yet near day. It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Nightly she sings on yon pomegranate tree. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. It was the lark, the herald of the morn. No nightingale. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severing clouds in yonder east. Night's candle is burnt out and jocund day stands tiptoe on the misty mountaintops. I must be gone and live, or stay and die. Yon light is not daylight. I know it, I. It is some meteor that the sun exhales. To be to thee this night a torchbearer to light thee on thy way to Mantua. Therefore, stay yet. Thou needs not to be gone. Let me be taken. Let me be put to death. I am content, so thou will have it so. I'll say, yon gray is not the morning's eye. Tis but a pale reflex of Cynthia's brow. Nor that is not the lark whose notes do beat the vaulty heaven so high above our heads. I have more care to stay than will to go. Come, death, and welcome. Juliet wills it so. How is it, my love? Let's talk. It is not day. It is! It is! Hi, hence be gone away! It is the lark that sings so out of tune, straining harsh discords and unpleasing sharps. Some say the lark makes sweet division. This doth not so, for she divideth us. Some say the lark and low the toad change eyes. Oh, now I would they had changed voices too, since arm from arm that voice doth us affray, hunting thee hence with hunts up to the day. Oh, now be gone, more light and light it grows. More light and light, more dark and dark our woes. Then, window, let day in, and let life out. Farewell. Farewell. One kiss, and I'll descend. <laughs> <laughs> Art thou gone so? Love, Lord, I, husband, friend, I must hear from thee every day in the hour, for in a minute there are many days. Oh, by this count I shall be much in years ere I again behold my Romeo. Farewell. I will omit no opportunity to convey my greetings, love, to thee. Oh, thinks thou we shall ever meet again? 
I doubt it not. And all these woes shall serve as sweet discourses in our times to come. Oh God, I have an ill divining soul. Methinks I see thee now that art below as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails or thou lookst pale. And trust me, love, in my eyes so do you. Dry sorrow drinks our blood. Adieu. Thank you so much. I, I can say these are performers from the new Swan Shakespeare Festival at UCI. As someone who's attended for many years, I heartily recommend it. For those of you on the video in the area, it's easily accessible. And for those of you up here, it's worth the trip down south. New Swan Shakespeare Festival at UCI. And so now, Bailiff, do we have the result? Thank you. Friar Lawrence, you'll stand, please. <laughs> and thus it is for love. Two youths were killed. The friar, now through law, his fate fulfilled. Involuntary manslaughter, guilty, 204, not guilty, 174. Child endangerment, Guilty, 272, not guilty, 55. <laughs> the jury has spoken. We hope to see you again next year without masks. Uh, it's always a delight to be here in Berkeley. Thank you all very much, and thanks. To